Welcome to our next episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. This is Bob Mosier, one of the many co-hosts you'll meet throughout this series. So friends, are you trying to learn more about the five moments of need? Maybe how to design for them, implement for them, measure them, and even sell them as an approach to your enterprise. Well, in the Performance Matters series, we will help you better understand the theory and best practices behind this powerful methodology and offer proven ways to put the five moments of need into practice. Welcome back, everyone. Bob Mosier here, one of your co-hosts of the Performance Matters series, and I am honored again to be joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Khan Gofferson. Welcome, Khan. Thank you, Bob. It's good to be doing another one of these podcasts. <laughs> it certainly is. And this is an important one, right? I mean, this is we get yeah. asked this all the time, right? This, uh, how do I sell the five moments of need to my stakeholders. This is a big deal for for folks. And in the end, it's kind of what gets us there to even be allowed to do things in the first place. So what we're going to run at today is a combination of a lot of data we've collected, frankly. Um, We've brought this together from our recent summit that we had in Utah. A lot of you may not know about that, but you'll hear more about that in a bit. We had a five moment summit, got some wonderful best practices from the 25 plus organizations that joined us there as well as just, frankly, the experience that, Khan, you and I have had over the years in the work that we've done. So let's start with this idea about the five moments in general. Let's throw something out at you guys to think about in the first place, and that is that the irony of the five moments and having to sell it, part of it for me is if you have to sell it, maybe you haven't positioned it right in the first place. In other words, you may not have your stakeholders in the right frame of mind of what the five moments does. The five moments is a methodology that solves a problem that every person comes to us with who wants training. And that is, in the end, how do my people perform when they're trying to transfer and sustain their knowledge? So we want to make a recommendation. Not to repeat, but we did a podcast a while back called Train, Transfer, Sustain that you can find in this series. We would highly recommend that you go back and take a look at that series and frankly lead with that. Once people get Train, Transfer, Sustain, which is ultimately what anyone who comes to us wants, the next question they should ask or that we can help them ask is, well, then how do you get that? How do we build a true train transfer sustained solution? And folks, it's a five moments approach. So so again, we won't cover it here, but by all means, go back and listen to train transfer sustain. You've got to get them to the water to make the horse drink. And train transfer sustain is the mindset you need them in for much of what we'll talk about today to work. So take a look at that. So Khan, you want to talk a little bit about stakeholders in general, some principles that we really think that they need to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, Bob, organizational will is what we're talking about here. That is, how do you build the organizational will to transition to a five-moment solution and then sustain that will in the journey? Because it does take some energy and time, but yet at the end, it transforms an organization in ways that we've never been able to before. And what we found in that journey is that there are two key areas that we need to focus on in terms of developing that organizational will. And the first has to do with the L&D team and the second, the enterprise on the whole, that is the business, helping them see and understand and actually work towards embracing the five moments of need methodology and approach. And what we have to understand is within both of these areas where they're very unique and they each have their own set of challenges, there are subgroups. And we've got to figure out how to get to each one of those groups and how to communicate with them in such a way that we overcome their resistance that is often there because they don't understand and really bring them in to being supportive and helping bring about this important, vital change that organizations need to make. So in the end game, what we've learned is that nothing beats seeing it and having those that they trust share with them their experiences, their positive experiences, their testimonials. And then in the end run, when you get to where you can gather data, to reinforce that with strong data. Brilliant. And folks, so one thing you have to be careful of and understand is that, you know, although you're going to develop your overarching message, one message doesn't fit all. 
you have to understand that there's an element of each deck you create that we'll talk about today, each principle we talk about today that is unique to Khan's point to each stakeholder. And you have to know your stakeholder. You have to research your stakeholder. You have to interview your stakeholder. You have to listen to your stakeholder. Guys, this is classic marketing and sales stuff. 101 that honestly, you know, us in L&D are not necessarily great at. All right. So before you can convince someone, you have to understand what they need. You have to understand their pain. You have to understand their confusion. You have to understand where they might feel threatened or they might be defensive. These kinds of things are classic marketing and selling ideas. So as Khan said a moment ago, you have got to get your team on board. I can't tell you how many times we've went into companies to help with a five moments of need initiative, sometimes even brought in by the L&D team itself, and they end up being our hardest stakeholder because they're just so vested right, in, in what they've done. We've talked about before in this difficult change for them to go from a training mindset to a performance one. If we can't get our teams on board, there is no way we're going to get to the enterprise and sell this. So a couple fundamental things at the team level, and then we're going to go into those unique stakeholders that Khan talked about. So number one, friends, just 101 stuff. Do you know and does your team understand what five moments of need means? Do you have a collective vocabulary? Do you have a collective definition? Can you do your elevator pitch, right? The classic, you've got two floors to tell somebody what you do, no PowerPoints. You have to sit down as a team and you have to understand and be able to talk the talk of five moments from what it is to its elements, i.e. process, task, supporting knowledge, critical skills, analysis, all the definition in terms you've heard us all talk about. You as a team have to collectively understand what those mean. Now, as Khan said a moment ago, nothing beats experiencing it, right? One of the most powerful approaches we've seen L&D teams use and leaders of L&D teams use to win their team over is to have them be the first client. How better a way to be able to tell others the power of the five moments if you've experienced it as a learner? So one of the more powerful ways to sway or convince these stakeholders is let them be a consumer. Build performance support for your team. Pick out a process you work on, something that you got onboarding, how you develop courses, how you write e-learning. You know, pick something that you folks do for a living. Do an RWA on it. Do the analysis. Build performance support and let them see the power so that they're convinced that they would want to do that for others. Now, a couple last things, and then we'll we'll go into the first stakeholder we find most important. You need a way to keep the conversation going. So one thing that we heard at the summit, frankly, was one organization created a five moments of need learning forum is what they called. And they met on weekly, biweekly basis to not just have collected that vocabulary to start, but to continually refine it, to continually talk about how it was going. How is messaging going? What are we misunderstanding? What have we learned about our process? You know, how the last project go? Share best ideas. All these things, in other words, to keep the strategy and the dialogue and the messaging in the forefront and constantly being refined so that we can talk the talk and have experienced it. And guys, the last thing is the goal here is to make everyone an evangelist. I mean, Khan and I are that, right? So you got to win the hearts and minds of individuals, right? The heart is the experiencing part. But one thing we see not done well enough is the mind, in, in other words, equipping your evangelist with tools, communication strategies we'll talk about. Proof of concepts we'll talk about. Your talk track we'll talk about. Those are tangible tools of the trade that an evangelist goes into any instance with and armed to be effective. So equip your evangelist, not just with the heart, and totally they have to get it, but don't just send them off randomly to do the best they can. Be intentional about equipping them with tools that help them evangelize and speak the message in a consistent way. So, Khan, let's talk about one of the more difficult stakeholders within the team that we see and needs to be addressed. Sure. You know, Bob, and as you know, in 2016, we started our first benchmarking summit. And in that summit, we went in depth into assessing and looking at these key stakeholders in the L&D team. And the one stakeholder that was ignored by every organization almost were trainers. And it was astonishing for us to see that because trainers make or break it. They're the folks that are right on the front line. If they don't believe in it, if they're resistant to it, then it's not going to make its way into the real world of work, a true five-moment solution. 
that's going to to really change. So they become a very important group for us to figure out how to bring on board. I think one of the most important in the journey to five moments. Absolutely. And and the thing is, to Khan's point, they're where the journey begins. An effective five moments of need transition for the learner, who's clearly a stakeholder, is that they feel comfortable with the process. They feel comfortable standing self-reliant. They feel comfortable operationally using the performance support you build. There's no better place to learn that than the classroom. But the trainer has to get that, and they have to know how to do it. They have to know how to integrate it. And frankly, they have to know how to not feel threatened by it because it's going to change the way they train. So two things real quick to share in this area that are actually kind of help win them over. Yes, every trainer goes to bed with two fears of not covering all the content. They always feel that class are going to get that day that they have the talker in the room or the class isn't up to speed. So they're terrified about not covering everything. And secondly, they're terrified about being good. They're always nervous about being on, right? Well, you guys, the exciting thing about five moments is the way it changes targeted learning is that, which we've talked about in other podcasts, is that it allows the trainer to, number one, not have to cover everything. It frees them to do what they do best and make the class a rich experiential place. And secondly, they don't have to be perfect because the EPSS is perfect. Their job is to help learners find knowledge and learn when they're not there. A very different level of pressure, frankly, and different expectations and responsibility than having to be the tip of the sword and carry the day. The EPSS can carry the day. So, Khan, IDs. (laughs) Well, (laughs) you're not going to ever get to a true five-moment solution unless your instructional designers can take you there. This is where the skills of developing and designing a five-moment solution rest. And so you certainly want the solution built right so that trainers can do what they do, so that you can show the rest of L&D that this really does make a difference in the business. The bottom line is that your instructional designers have to have the skill set, and it is a unique skill set because we're asking them to do more than what they've typically done. And we want them to do it within the same footprint of effort that they spend currently. And so to do that, there is a strong methodology that that we've developed over many, many years and proven. And they just simply need to, to learn that, to experience that, to become convinced, you know, through doing that this is how they ought to go about instructional design. It has to be rapid, it has to be agile, it has to be performance-focused, it has to include all five moments of need. And then they have to know how to blend all of that together in an optimum way to ensure that the solution is everything that it needs to be and that we're pushing into the workflow, learning as we can push it in and all that's involved in a five-moment solution. They're the heart of it in terms of being able to make that happen. And you've got to train them, certify them, get them there in five moments methodology. Often a role that's in tandem with that that we've seen in organizations, but in many, frankly, I've seen struggle or not be well-defined, or if I may, I don't think they live up sometimes to the title, is what we've heard called performance consultants. A lot of companies have had these. We ran into them years ago. The irony of the title is that many of them often, frankly, are handcuffed. Really, all some of them are, to be completely frank, is order takers. They're the front line to the line of business often. They're positioned sometimes within the line of business, and their job is to, frankly, take orders for training, clearly clarify it and quantify it a bit, but then come back to the L&D department and act on those orders. Well, guys, in this world, in the five moments of need, this role changes dramatically. They, They become true performance consultants based on the things that they do when they're doing analyzing and designing and analyzing the enterprise. So it it really creates a whole new role of them being true champions for the business. But pivoting now on performance, not order taking that so many of them have been frustrated with. One of the more powerful parts of that, because we're going to shift to enterprise here in a moment, is someone has to be able to help the enterprise by saying no. Someone has to be able to have that relationship with the frontline manager with to say, look, you guys, 
you don't want training now. And by the way, we have a way of, of meeting that need. But no, this is not going to be five days of something. It's not going to be three e-learnings on that. We're not going to blend those things. As I know, historically, we have because we have a better toolkit now. So sure, we'll still do some training. But no, you need a much more rich solution that I, as the performance consultant, can do some front end work and analysis with you to get the right solution for what my team and the L&D team will ultimately build. You know, Bob, in reality, they need to become performance advocates. Mm, that's that's that. what that's what's missing in organizations today. Most performance consultants, as you said, are really learning consultants. They're not <laughs> advocating and bringing the organization to the point of looking at performance of their people and mm. meeting those performance requirements. Great very, point. very important shift. So leadership, guys, in the end, you know, we, we've talked about sort of a progression here from the trainers who are frontline IDs and such. But in the end, any five moments of need solution that's worked, that's become institutionalized, that's become part of the DNA, starts with a strong L&D leader. You've heard many of them on this podcast. You're going to hear them in another series on experience matters. Listen to those folks. They are what we would call courageous leaders. It sounds almost cliche. But it takes courage to champion this movement. And fundamentally, anyone that we've seen do it, for the leaders out there listening or those of you that obviously want to convince or talk to them, leaders have to know this. They have to understand it. They don't have to be certified per se, but they really have to understand the methodology to drive business results. And therefore, it enables them to have a very different conversation to Khan's point about the performance consultants with lines of business like never before. We can start having discussions as leaders about true business analytics, business analytics in ROI that helps drive performance. The five moments of need methodology enables a learning leader to talk about KPIs, to talk about things that matter to the business, not just fulfilling learning deliverables. So the L&D leader becomes really important, not in doing, most leaders don't have that level of input, but they absolutely have to champion all we've talked about, vocabulary, certifying their folks, and most importantly, going out into the enterprise and championing what the five moments of need can be for the company as a whole that the department can now offer. So let's shift to that enterprise a little bit, right? We can finally be different, friends. So a couple fundamental things at the high level. Number one is we can now be seen very different. We don't have to be that service center or that wing of the building or the corporate university anymore. We can be true strategic partners, but we have to focus in a couple areas. We have to stop focusing on learning and training in all of our vocabulary, all of our deliverables, and pivot instead on performance. And because of that, we need to, from the beginning, start talking about and have the conversations early about measurable business results and impact, not learning metrics. Put the LMS away, and not entirely, but stop leading with completions, attendance, these types of things and start changing the conversation. And when people walk into your office to start, let's enter those conversations and pivot on performance questions, not our normal training deliverables. Now, let me introduce you to something we have to get better at and a muscle that I know for me was weak. As a trained ID, I knew formally little to nothing about sales and marketing. But we talked about this before. That's what this whole podcast is about. There's something called a communication plan, friends, that anyone who knows those domains understands and is taught in 101 stuff. You have to have one. Go out on the Internet. Google it. There are communication plan templates you can work off of if this is not familiar to you. But it is a formal and structured way to find out what's in it for your buyer. Ask all the important questions so that you can then come back with the answers. We're so used to training to be honest, you guys, sometimes I don't think we listen well. A communication plan and, and developing a good one is all about an elevator pitch, understanding risks and things that you have to answer, knowing your audience, these types of things. That type of exercise will be critical for your organization to have. You know, Bob, just one part of that is I remember in my early years when I was working for a, a large multinational organization, I found that if I could find other organizations or leaders in other organizations that 
had credibility with the leadership in my company, if they were speaking and giving the message that I wanted to give, it had tremendous impact and influence. And so finding organizations and other leaders that your leadership in your organization can see as credible, that's a really powerful way to begin the journey of communication. You know, and I think that's key, Con, because what you don't want to come across is as a one-hit wonder right? This isn't something you thought up in the cubicle in your company, right? This is a global movement. There's people practicing the five moments across the globe. There are organizations well into this journey who have multiple solutions who have even changed the learning culture. So to your point, part of selling any change, it's risk, right? And so mitigating risk by having others come in who've gone ahead of you and share those stories, share the analytics, share actual examples can have those you're trying to convince to go, okay, look, this isn't just something that Bob thought up and that we're trying for the first time. This is a credible, viable approach that speaks to the things that we've talked about. Yeah, and folks, as you move into this and you begin the journey, one of the first things that you've got to be really careful is that you don't try to boil the ocean. We've seen it, right, Bob? And it doesn't work. You only have so much organizational will to work with, and you've got to deliver impact within the framework of that organizational will, because once you lose that, then it's very difficult to regain. And so you've got to make sure that your initial projects are projects that you can deliver on, deliver quickly, gather data to demonstrate that it's a value. And so you can't take on and try to boil the ocean. You may survey the entire world that you need to have, but then you've got to narrow it into something that you can truly deliver on rapidly and make an impact that you can then share with the organization, with that leadership. Well, and that's why I proof of concepts, everything. Oh, yeah. We we, we talked about Ignazium, right? And, And what I love about the five moments and performance support is a proof of concept can be fairly small and highly focused. You know, the days of building a pilot or a class or a course to show something are gone. When you do your analysis and you pick that first stakeholder, you can find a very specific business performance issue gap and build your POC around that. It doesn't have to be this exhaustive process of months of analysis. We've seen it done in days, but get something out there that people can see and and touch and experience. Yeah, and working in underneath the radar just a bit sometimes is helpful, where you're getting your feet under you, you find a key stakeholder who is is with you, you work with it, you get it and revise it until you make sure that it's truly working, and then you begin to share with the organization what you're doing. Yeah, right, in in the end, right, numbers win the day. Yeah. Right, this is what, the third time we brought this up, because it's one of those overarching things that we finally can get to, right? (laughs) ROI has been an elusive acronym in our business forever, right? In this world of five moments, get at the numbers, build a POC, pick a performance gap, and then report back on the impact of that performance gap. Nothing will get you momentum better than truly showing that we can finally build a solution that gets to that. They'll ask you for tons of it if you can start there. And that's especially the case at the executive level What we found in the benchmarking is that frontline leaders are the first to get it because they see it. They see the real impact on the work of their people and how they're able to get things done and so forth. And so they're the first to get the impact and the power of it. Division leaders are next, but executive leaders, until they see the data, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. So it takes time to be able to gather that data. Just know that your frontline leaders are going to come in quickly, the right division leaders or that upper level of key stakeholders, you find a key influencer and an innovator, they're going to get it and become a champion. And that's going to get you off the ground. But you've got to, in the process, be positioning yourself to gather the data because executive leaders won't get it until they see that data. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously, guys, in the end, it's all about the frontline manager. This really is the one who matters most. Clearly, executive buy-in is important, particularly if you go to the point of maybe buying a tool and other things we talked about. You need funding and support. 
But that starts at the frontline manager. These are the people who see the results every day and their people performing. So a couple of things to think about is five moments of need lives in the workflow at the moment of apply is where it best does what it does. What many frontline managers don't understand now is how highly inefficient their people are today. You know, Khan, you've shared the research before that one day a week, one full day out of five a week, people are frankly doing nothing productive. They're searching, they're finding things, they're not finding things, they're bothering others. That's a lot of time. And many frontline managers kind of just think that's the nature of doing business. Highlight those inefficiencies. Have them see, because those are the numbers you're going to point to. That's the impact you're going to highlight. So have them understand that. And also, for them, it's all about keeping their people. If I have sales folks, I want them selling. I don't want them spending six days in class. Well, again, one number you've heard us toss around before, but I don't know a frontline manager that this wouldn't mean something to, is on average, you can reduce time away from work and time in training by half. I mean, who wouldn't take a shot at that from having salespeople not away from selling for five days, but only for two and a half? This is what matters. These numbers are what matters to frontline managers and executives in general. We have to start learning to talk this talk. And it's not a hard pitch beyond that. Don't oversell it. This is all they need to see. Then say, look, let me build a POC. Let me try. We'll come back with the numbers and we'll talk. But once you get that opening, that's the close, friends. And a salesperson will tell you that's the close. Take a walk and do your work. Yeah. Frontline managers get workflow learning, you know, more quickly than others. When you explain it as they learn, you know, people are learning as they do their jobs. Yep. And they're supportive of that much more so than we would think. So other individual stakeholders are your IT leaders, your HR leaders, regulators. These are folks that you need to be thinking about as well. And interesting, the the recent benchmarking data showed that IT leaders and HR leaders are okay in terms of everything except time. They still want to dictate the time that you take to learn that time. They're protective of that. So there's some work that we have to do to bring them on board, and their drivers are unique, and we need to understand that. I know that one of the things that we found is that as we do work, an IT project, or as we do an HR project, a five moments project, that brings them along, and then Regulators, that's a another challenge, but an EPSS can be the binder that regulators are wanting everybody to refer to. So there's a lot of opportunity there, we know, to bring them along. And the reason we include them and call them out, frankly, is one of the common excuses, Con, we hear is, well, we can't do performance support because we're a highly regulated industry. We have compliance, classic obstacle to enterprise resistance to EPSSs and performance support. You can absolutely still build it in complement to the compliance they have to do. Remember, it's five moments, friends. There's still moments one and two. And moments one and two speaks to training and testing and compliance. Totally get that. But friends, don't bail on the back end of three through five because compliance should lead to performance. And in many organizations, when a violation occurs, we have nothing to show how we were supporting those people in the workflow. The EPSS, for those that have tried and been courageous to go here, helps the regulators see that, yes, you're, not, you're just not going to test them again and then come back and show that they passed. You're going to actually have ways of showing and validating and following performance and showing how that improves in complement to your training. So, friends, it's all about the pitch. It's all about sales and marketing, a muscle that's not our best. But we hope this podcast has helped you understand that there's some pretty significant stakeholder groups out there and there's ways to dissect each of them. At the same time, there are some common themes that run through this as well that help win them over and win the day for five moments to work. Khan, thanks so much, my friend, as always. Thank you, Bob. And friends, thanks for listening. We'll be back again in a future podcast. Well, that's it for this episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. We look forward to future conversations around how to best put the five moments of need into practice. We welcome your feedback and can be reached on Twitter using my Twitter handle at B-M-O-S-H, as well as our five moments of need website, which is www.thenumber5momentsofneed.com. We hope you're finding these helpful and will subscribe to future episodes. Have a great day, friends.